Hello everyone, welcome to Take Charge of Your Health and to our third weekend of Mental Health Month. I'm your host, Zosia Stojkovic. Type your comments and questions in the chat box on YouTube as we will have a Q&A segment at the end of the presentation. The presentations from the last two weekends can be found on our YouTube channel and we will make sure to upload them on Rumble as well. Our guest speaker today is Jennifer Skews. Jennifer is a practicing health psychologist, and if you would like to know more about her, watch our presentation, Getting Off the Emotional Roller Coaster" from June. The Spirit of Prophecy says, We are to grow daily in spiritual loveliness. We shall fail often in our efforts to copy the divine pattern. We shall often have to bow down to weep at the feet of Jesus because of our shortcomings and mistakes. But we are not to be discouraged. We are to pray more fervently, believe more fully, and try again with more steadfastness to grow into the likeness of our Lord. As we distrust our own power, we shall trust the power of our Redeemer and render praise to God, who is the health of our countenance and our God. By beholding, we are to become changed, and as we meditate upon the perfections of the divine model, we shall desire to become wholly transformed and renewed in the image of His purity." It is by faith in the Son of God that transformation takes place in the character and the child of wrath becomes the child of God. Welcome to the program, Jennifer. Thank you so much for being with us again. Oh, it's a pleasure. I enjoy uh, working with you. In the, certainly in the previous program we did. Yeah, thank you for coming back. It was definitely a blessing um, to have the last couple of presentations. Um, so today we're talking about having the mind of Christ. Yes. Um, that is the ultimate goal for every Christian, right? So we want to know how to achieve that. We do, and it's a daily battle. So people want to know how to win that battle. Yes, that's right. So shall we start with a word of prayer? Absolutely. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity again and for all the opportunities we've had so far to discuss mental health. Um, we have learned that our mental health is closely connected to our physical health and um, to have abundant health we need to uh, make sure that these are in harmony with each other thank you for our speaker today please um, speak through jennifer today and help us to hear and understand and um, what we hear we can put into practice we thank you so much again and we ask all these in jesus precious name amen amen thank you right um as you can see, I've t entitled this Our Amazing Brain and Mind, so how can we have the mind of Christ? And if you want to understand the mind, you also have to understand the brain because we really are um, fairly complex, you could say, in how we function, um, even though there is a lot we can do. And this is Psalm 139, 13 to 16, says, For you are for, for you form my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. And this is where God has created us in a way that we do not fully understand and certainly science doesn't understand and I know we all struggle because um, of the way we are created. 
So we're going to explore some of those things today. Um, and I'm starting off with a quote from Ellen White in Testimonies and the spirit of prophecy has a lot to say about the brain, the mind and brain function. Um, and it is very biblically based. And in this case, this is in 1872, which is well over 100 years ago. And it, she said, the brain is a capital of the body, the seat of all the nervous forces and of mental action. The nerves proceeding from the brain control the body. By the brain nerves, mental impressions are conveyed to all the nerves of the body as by telegraph wires, and they control the vital action of every part of the system. All the organs of motion are governed by the communications they receive from the brain. Um, now, like this is probably 120 years ago, and yet this is something she didn't have the science that we have now, so it had to be inspired um, in her understanding, whereas today science is actually confirming a lot of what she wrote about health. She was one of our early health reformers. And this is some quotes about our amazing brain because we're going to start by looking at the brain first. And it says, the human brain is truly the most sophisticated, elegant, biological piece of machinery ever known. You don't have to be a neuroscientist to understand some basic brain science. Our brains are constantly in a state of flux, which means they're constantly working. It's a bit like driving a car and braking the accelerator. Moment by moment, new neurons are developing and new circuits are being laid down. Unused connections are removed. Dormant nerve tracts are pruned back and unused neurons are deleted. Now, neurons are the cells. They're the connecting cells. In one of my slides, I've got a picture of uh, just a diagram of some of a neurons to give us an idea of what it's like. But these neurons are cells that are laid out and make multiple connections. And this writer says, incredibly, our beliefs, thoughts, behaviours and even our diets change our brain structure, ultimately changing who we are. We really don't realize how much we do on a daily basis that constantly changes the brain. And this is Dr. Timothy Jenning. He's a psychiatrist and Christian, and his book, The God-Shaped Brain, is definitely worth looking at. He has some excellent information and material. And this was an interview with a Dr. Andrew Newberg, and he, again, was a Christian and a scientist, but he did this on faith in the brain. And he reports that meditation improves memory and reduces stress and that the kind of God you worship can affect the structure of your brain. If you have a look, what is Christian meditation we're talking about here? And that is prayer, worship, meditating on the word of God, meditating on God's creation. Um, and when we have a God of love that we worship, and it's not just a distant God, this is a God we can connect to, it does change a structure of the brain. Um, and it's a constant daily change. So the more we put in these positives, the more we focus our attention on God and on his love and creation, the more the cha changes we find the brain, it will grow. And we've learned that being religious or spiritual has a very profound effect on who we are, has a very profound effect on our biology and on our brain. It actually can change our brain and change ourselves over time. So when you have a look at um, being religious or spiritual, one of the big factors is prayer. And there's been a lot of research on the power of prayer. And they find that people who pray and have faith um, have a much better way of coping with things. They might be depressed, but they don't go into that depths of depression that people who don't do that know they cope better with things and the brain seems to be more resilient. Uh, and this is because of their prayer and their faith. Now, what does science really know about the brain? Well, not much compared to what the brain is. It's one of the least understood systems of the body. Um, and they estimate maybe they know about, um, sorry, we'll go back to that slide. They estimate that they know about maybe 30, 40% of brain function. And of course, with technology, that is improving. But it's one of the unknown frontiers and one of the mysteries that 
I don't believe science can ever solve. Only God knows about our brain on that level. It's an organ of adaptation and built by experience. So if we have good experiences and um, positives, then it builds in that direction. But if we have negative experience and don't adapt, uh, then it builds the brain or it can actually damage the brain. The brain is made up of trillions of cells. It's hard to comprehend, and they're those neurons, and is a complex chemical factory. We have thousands of chemicals in our system. It's just amazing when you look at, uh, under a microscope, scientists say that the complexity and the chemicals are amazing. We only look at a few of those chemicals, and working with people who are depressed, and I work with psychiatrists and medical people and um, look at science, and um, it seems that these, the chemicals in the brain, the ones we focus on, dopamine, serotonin, and often norepinephrine, are only three of hundreds of chemicals in the brain that affect our mood and affect the way we are. But science has targeted those three in particular to try and treat depression. But unfortunately, it doesn't fully treat depression. What it will do is it will help the brain to do some functioning, but we then have to make the changes to then help assist the brain, if not the chemicals that are put into the brain or what the antidepressants doing isn't going to fix it. So part of what I do is help people change, not just the structure, but the way the chemicals are in the brain, how they're using them. Um, and this is where nutrition and diet, and there's lots of things that we can do that affect that. The next point is everything we know, remember, or experience is encoded by a complex set of cells called the neurons, which we mentioned. And that, that picture below is a neuron that uh, it's one of, and remember, there are trillions of these, and you can see they've got lots of connectors, and these connecting things interlock with other neurons. So when you have a thought and you repeat the thought, it interlocks and it builds trillions of cells into a highway or a freeway that the brain functions on. And it doesn't just send chemical messages. It also, and you can see it has electrical impulses as well. So it certainly is amazing. And the brain is the seat of all consciousness and the source of all thought. The brain never stops thinking. It is constantly um, thinking. Even if you don't think you're thinking, you're thinking. And uh, thoughts can be very subtle. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's something the brain is constantly active. And you can see why we have so many battles in the brain at times to actually stop that um, source of thought is not possible. So um, it's our conscious awareness. Um, and we'll talk about that a bit more as we go. It's a use it or lose it principle. If we don't use brain cells, they die and are eliminated. So I think that's important um, to remember. And there's a lot you can do to strengthen the brain. The brain stores information in the five senses. So that means we have several, two parts of the brain in the more in the essential emotional brain or the limbic system that actually stores emotional memories as well as visual or contextual memories in the five senses. So you actually have a video in your brain that's a five sense around video. And that is core sight, sound, touch, taste and smell. Um, that means any event you have um, connects to those senses. And this is why one of the senses can trigger a memory, whether it be a good memory, a traumatic memory, it can easily be triggered by one of the senses. Uh, now, this information forms pathway in the brains that can be reinforced to develop permanent habits. Now, they become permanent if we keep using them. If you stop using a habit, the habit, the cells start to, uh, die out but at the same time the habit there's a residue of that habit and it can be resurrected whether it be a good habit or a bad habit now brain scientists have found that the brain doesn't like being broken so it will constantly repair clean up and renew itself well that's good news you know this thing of um you know the brain once you damage your brain that's it and they found that uh the brain if that you've had a stroke and we know that with speech, if you lose speech, if you do speech therapy, the brain already knew how to do that before the stroke. And what it will do, it will remap that ability to 
speak in another part of the brain. So the part that the stroke is damaged is bypassed and the brain renews itself in a different area. So you can see how amazing our brain is, that God has given us this incredible brain and we're constantly balancing it. Um, and the last point there, the brain has neuroplasticity, so can change, grow and be moulded until the day we die. We must never stop challenging the brain and using it. And if people tell you you're too old to use your brain, don't, don't believe them because uh, in actual fact, the older we get, the smarter we should get because the brain, we should be working in the right direction here. So we are truly and fearfully wonderfully made, much of which remains a mystery, as we said, to modern science today. There's a lot they will not understand. So from the brain then, because we've got the brain and then we've got the mind. So what is the mind? Now, the mind is the only part of the brain or of our conscious awareness that works through the brain. So we need to understand this relationship. So, of course, if you're brain dead, then your mind is no longer working. Um, and that's when we're looking here at the actual brain. The neocortex is that front part of that third of the brain here. And there is a diagram below where you can see that frontal lobe there. And a third of the brain is called the frontal lobe. It's divided by what we call a bundle of nerves called the corpus callosum. So it's into two sections, left and right hemisphere. And as we go, we'll talk a bit more either today or uh, tonight or tomorrow night about left and right hemispheres and how they function. Um, the conscience is housed at the front of the brain, just behind our forehead. It's about the centre. And behind that bone in the, the forehead there, you have the conscience um, which they have found is a working part of the brain. Um, the will resides from the front to the back of the neocortex along the division of the left and right hemispheres. So in your brain, from there through to the back, you have the, uh, the um, neocortex and what we call the will, which is also around the area where we have that corpus callosum. So the brain, the conscious awareness of the brain works with the conscience and the will, which we're going to focus more on tomorrow night. Um, it's presentation. Now, they're both physical parts of the brain that direct the mind to make a moral value decision and action it. Um, in actual fact, people can shut down, uh, which you've probably heard about the conscience or not have a good conscience. So all of that influences the decisions we make for good or for bad. Now, the brain is the physical part of the mind that expresses what is programmed in it. So Christian neuroscientist Dr. Carolyn Leaf explains that the mind works through the brain but is separate from the brain. So even though they're two integrated parts, they're definitely separate. We are consciously aware when awake and unconsciously active when asleep. In fact, the subconscious is highly active at night, more active than during the day. So you wonder why you have busy nights and a busy brain and wake up and can't get back to sleep or you might have dreams or nightmares or whatever because of that activity. The brain through that process is trying to de-stress and it's part of that pruning and that repair process. So sleep is vital um, to be consciously aware when we're awake in a healthy way and have a good rest where the the unconscious or that subconscious activity can start to repair itself. Now, the vast majority of the brain's processing happens below the level of the mind's conscious awareness. So you are consciously aware, but most of the activity is below. So what you're listening to now is being processed by your brain and it's putting in new pathways, it's making sense of things. Um, so afterwards you can think about it and recall it, but it's a lot of it is below the mind's conscious awareness. So we have like levels of brain function. Now the left and right hemispheres or neocortex is where uh, conscious activity and processing takes place and it's gender specific, okay? So that means um, male and female have different 
capacities with the left and right brain. The left hemisphere can process information on a more logical, rational level to make decisions, and the right hemisphere is more that creative, intuitive side, but it's also connected to our emotional memories, which are stored in the five senses. Now, we need a balance of left and right, and when we're not functioning well, then that balance is disturbed, then either we're too intellectual and logical and rational, and uh, seem maybe even cold because we're distant or we are emotional memories being acted out and 90% of our memory in the present are often our emotional memories. So, you know, when you have a reaction to something in the present moment and you might feel angry, sad, happy, it's loaded with your emotional memories connected to those events and the five senses and you think, oh, why am I so passionate about that? Or why do I overreact to things? Well, this is because of those emotional memories. So some of what I do is help people to deal with um, emotional memories in the present. And that's what we're going to look at now because the mind needs to be focused in the present moment to maintain physical, mental, emotional and spiritual health and balance. So the question is, where is your focus and what can you change? And we can change a lot of things and we can shift our focus. Um, and I developed this model based on working with people who were highly depressed or highly anxious. And as you get to know them and listen to what they're telling you and what they're thinking and what they believe, there's a definite focus either past or future. So they're often not in the present moment. So as you can see from this, our choices in the here and now um, uh, what we want to look at, and we're going to follow that through a bit more. But when you look back to the past, which is your left brain focus, your thinking brain is thinking about what happened and how it happened, um, we have a lot of unresolved past, what I call the emotional baggage, emotional memories, some, and we can have good memories, but when the bad memories or the trauma or what's happened to us, the grief, the loss, the disappointments happen, and we outweigh those with the good memories then we can get depressed and what you're doing in the present in is actually resurrecting that gloom and doom thinking and beliefs like oh it always happens to me why does this happen to me i always had this bad luck nothing good ever goes right for me and that's based on the past and of course we're going to feel depressed um or if it's going to happen to anyone that's going to happen to me, those sorts of beliefs and values. So this is where I help people modify and change their beliefs. But you can do that as long as you identify it, realise it's not productive, and then um, work on it in the present moment. Now, choices for the future can create anxiety. And I'm not saying we all do this, but any fear, thinking and beliefs is going to project into anxiety. It's right brain focus, which is that emotional memory bank, um, so we are not to fear the future. And I find, see, this is where as a Christian, and this is where we're Christ-centred, we don't have to fear the future. The past is gone. God forgives and we have to come to terms with that and take anything to him that is a problem. And then it, the Bible tells us to be anxious for nothing. So not to project into the future. We trust God and have to know that he will do the best for us and will help us through those challenges. So if we're Christ-centred in the present, then we will know when we're dragging up the past and we'll resolve it and we will stop projecting into the future. Uh, Christ takes the fear away. Now, as it says at the bottom, God's spirit renews and changes your heart and mind, which rewires and balances brain function. And we can only do that in the present moment. Now, what sort of mind does the Bible tell us to have so that we can live in the present moment with Jesus? And this is important. So this is in Philippians 2, verse 5. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So if we want to have a good mind in the present, we have to have Christ's mind in us, and that's a challenge. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2.16, For who hath known the mind of Christ that he should instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So it's telling us to have the mind of Christ. Now, we can't transplant a physical brain or mind into us, but we can transplant the beliefs, the values, the spiritual 
nature of Christ into the mind. And again, we can only be in the present with that and pray for it and ask for that. And then 1 Peter 4, 1 to 2 says, Christ's example is to be followed. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, that's the mind of Christ, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. And this is our dilemma, is the mind caught in the lusts of the world or are we in the will of God? Um, so that is, as I said earlier, is a daily battle. Right, so what was a mind like prior to the fall? And in Genesis 1.27, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. So what does it mean to be created in God's image? And how perfect was our mind when God created us? And uh, which comes back to our origins and our, our inheritance, which is through Adam and Eve. So Genesis 1.31 says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the Hebrew translation of good was exceedingly fine, beautiful, and the best. So isn't that good news? Now, you, hang on, we'll go back here. Uh, therefore, we must be perfect as our Father is perfect. We need that perfect mind as in Matthew 4, 28. So let's, uh, where are we here? Right, what was our mind like when God created Adam? So the Lord made man upright, and this is from um, Spirit of Prophecy, um, from some of the writings I had put the references at the bottom, and Ellen White had very good inspired insight, and she said the Lord made man upright in the beginning. He was created with a perfectly balanced mind. The size and strength of the organs of the mind were perfectly developed. Adam was a perfect type of man. Every quality of mind was well proportioned, each having a distinctive office and yet dependent one upon another for the full and proper use of any one of them. Now, don't we want a mind like that? That's what we're going to have. Certainly when we're in heaven, that's the sort of mind we're going to have. But we need to develop the quality of that mind here through Christ. Adam could take in the grand idea he was created in the image of God. Wouldn't that be nice? To be like him in righteousness and holiness. His mind was capable of, of continual cultivation, expansion, refinement and noble elevation. For God was his teachers and the angels were his companions. Now, I know I want to be in the Garden of Eden. I want to be in heaven. And uh, it, when you look at that, if that's what we're going to be like, which we will with that perfectly balanced mind, then it will be a glorious time. Now, the Bible tells us what the mind is like free from sin. Um, and there's some brilliant studies in the Bible on the mind, the heart, um, and it's worth doing a full study. Um, I'm just sharing little bits with you to give you an idea. Uh, so this is Romans 8, 5 and 6 I'm using. Um, the first part is, uh, you know, it looks at... Um, what mind the mind's like when we are not free from sin but this is the last part of romans 8 5 says but they that are after the spirit do mind the things of the spirit and i've used the amplified as well because it gives us a bit more elaboration on or expansion of that meaning and it says those who are living according to the spirit that is set their minds on the things of the spirit, which is his will and purpose. So when we do that, it's we're looking at God's will and purpose. And Romans 8, 6, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. But the mind of the spirit is life and peace. This is the Amplified, which is the spiritual well-being that comes from walking with God both now and forever. So it, it, we want to be spiritually minded. Um, and the mind of the spirit is the mind of Christ. So this is what we want to be able to do. We want to work in the spirit. And this is um, uh, from the youth instructor. And this was in early or 1903, early 1900s on keeping the heart. And it was Ellen White said, 
contrast man's physical, mental and moral feebleness with Adam's perfection before he transgressed God's law. Adam was a noble being with a powerful mind, a will in harmony with the will of God and affections that centred upon heaven. Now, this is what we need to ask for and develop a powerful mind and our will, which we're going to look at more um, tomorrow's program or tomorrow evening, a will in harmony with the will of God and your affections, that is our heart and our mind, they always work together, are centred upon heaven. So this is what we need to work at on a daily basis. So what was the mind like after the fall? Because this is what we're caught in. We have that... Um, daily battle again so what happened when sin entered the mind and this is uh from in 1905 from again from spirit of prophecy man's mind although divinely created may be worked by another power as was the mind of adam a man who had walked and talked with god he who foresees all things could in his providence have kept and directed Adam and Eve if they had heeded the warning against evil. And she says, so fully were they seduced that they could not discern the power that was leading them into apostasy. Now, this is where we know that uh, the devil is the father of lies, that he um, knows us incredibly well and he will do anything to dull the mind, to seduce us so we cannot discern the, where the power is coming from. We think it's us, but it's not. We are being attacked. And attack is in the mind. The only way we can be attacked is through the mind, through our thinking and our beliefs. So it can be worked by another power. And another um, quote it talks about mind um, working on mind and this is what when you look at Adam and Eve this is what happened in the Garden of Eden right because we all have a sinful nature that's what we're born with in Romans 3 23 so the question is how is Satan trying to seduce and deceive each one of us today and there are multiples more now than a hundred years ago we are just so sorely tempted and attacked so the Bible tells us how sin affected the mind and we became carnally minded. So let's look at that one. Romans 8, 5, we're coming back to the first part. For those who are living according to the flesh, and the flesh is what they refer to as the carnal nature, the fallen nature, set their minds on the things of the flesh and the things of the flesh gratify the body. So it's very physical. Now, isn't this what Adam and Eve did? Adam, um, he... He listened to Eve and chose to go with Eve and eat the apple because of his love for her. But Eve was deceived by the five senses. She did not know she was being deceived. Um, and she disobeyed God, which is where the deception started. But um, it worked on her five senses. What she saw, what she tasted. We don't know what the smells were, but certainly the voice she could hear from the serpent. So that's how we are deceived is through our senses. In Romans 8, 6 to 8, this is the first part, to be carnally minded is death because the carnal mind is enmity against God. That's where it's an enemy of God for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed it can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So we cannot, we're going against God. Um, this is the sinful nature. The Amplified says, now the mind of the flesh is death, both now and forever, because it pursues sin. So when we have that mind of flesh, it is eternal loss, eternal death. The mind of the flesh with its sinful pursuits is actively hostile to God. It does not submit itself to God's law. In other words, it breaks the commandments since it cannot. And those who are in the flesh living a life that caters to sinful appetites and impulses cannot please God. Now, please don't feel like, oh, what hope is there? Because we have every hope. And this is where through Christ and working on how he thought, what he believed, how he, he was, which we're going to look at in this presentation, how powerful that is in um, us heading in the right direction and having that mind of Christ. Because when we do that, we will not sin. We will not uh, respond to the flesh. And this is where our body still has the flesh, 
um, and it's still there, that nature is there. But with the mind and the heart, with Christ, we can choose not to listen to it and strengthen the will and the conscience in the right direction. So that is the battle. And as we know, Christ died. He overcame the flesh. He didn't give in to the sin of the flesh and he was resurrected. And we know that's what can happen to us. We want to be resurrected um, and this is what this is about. Now, another problem with the mind that's an interesting one um, is being double-minded. It's a major problem for the carnal nature because when you're double-minded, you can't worship both God and man. That's where we have that split, trying to please God and please man or work with both, and it will never work. We cannot have the mind of Christ. We might think we're with Jesus, but we're actually in the world or living in the flesh. So are you being double-minded? That's one of the questions you can look at. And Matthew 6, 24 says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other, because you cannot serve God and mammon or God and man. And James 1, 8 says, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Now, why is that so? Because when you've got, it's like having a foot in both camps or both doors. It mixes truth and error. Therefore, you find you're confused or deluded, but you don't know it. You believe lies and action lies. And we often see this in churches and Christians and people who try and have um, a foot in both doors, as they say. Now, James 4.8 gives the answer to being double-minded. He says, draw nigh to God, which means near to God, and he will draw nigh or near to you. It says, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts. So cleansing the hands is stop doing what we're doing that is um, against God, that is, well, that nature that is in the world, that lustful nature, and purify your hearts. So once you purify the heart, you're no longer double-minded. And who purifies the heart? This is where the Holy Spirit sanctifies us. And um, with Christ and having that mind, we can have a pure heart. So this is where we want to head towards. So let's have a look at what type of mind did Jesus have. Now, the Bible gives us an overview of the beliefs and values Christ had and lived. So with the mind of Christ, believers will live these beliefs and values as well. It's important. Um, now, a desire to bring glory to God is one of them, and that's in John 17, 5, where Jesus said, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. So we want Christ had that desire constantly to give God the glory to, to, for his Father, um, to bring glory to God. He also had a longing to provide salvation for sinners. And aren't we grateful for that? Or he would have given up on us because he came, because all of us, none have fallen short. We've all uh, are sinners. Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. So he gives us salvation. He never gives up on us. And we know that, that it's an important point, this one. So we need a longing to help other people because to help and share the good news of salvation. Jesus came to show us that good news, to live that good news. Um, and remember when we sin, we're actually disobeying God. We're um, breaking God's law in sin. And the Bible talks about that. And we don't want to do that because we can't have a loving heart and uh, bring glory to God when we're doing that. A perspective on humility and obedience. And this is in Philippians 2, 5 to 8. Remember, this is Jesus' qualities. He explains, your attitude be this, should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So when we look at Christ, Christ was one with the Father, so he had a divine nature, but he also 
inherited in coming as a human being, he inherited the sinful nature. Now, he could have gone to the sinful nature and he didn't. He kept his connection with God. He stayed connected with his father. And that's what he taught us. That's what he showed us constantly. He said, if you know me, you know the father. So as long as we have that same humility and obedience, and it's not easy because we've got pride. We've been taught. I know I was brought up with pride, with um, being an individual, of doing it my way, things like that. The system taught us that. Um, it was to do with the social values. So I'm still learning to have more humility and obedience. If we obey we, God, we're going to be humble. So I think that's an important point. That's something we need to look at each day. Now, um, this is also he has a compassionate heart. Matthew 9, 36 shows Jesus' compassion um, to the people. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So we want that compassionate heart. We don't want a hard-hearted heart. That's the world. If you have a look at the world at the moment, my goodness, how hard-hearted are systems and people and there is so much evil and so much um, cruelty that it's hard to believe at times um, and it's hard to find people with compassionate hearts at times, but they are there. But we want to be one of those and Christ had the most compassionate heart. So if we turn to Christ and take on the nature of Christ and in our mind, have that mind of Christ, we're going to have a compassionate heart. The heart and the mind are totally connected. Also, prayerful dependence on God, Luke 5, 16 says, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. So are you too busy? Um, Jesus was busy. You have a look at his life. I mean, he, thousands of people were following him, wanting him to talk. He was often with large groups and people all the time, but he always took the time and went out, uh, particularly at night if, if he had to, out on the boat, on the lake. Um, so he did things to get that time to connect with our Father. And we need to do that at least an hour a day where we focus on Christ, on the cross, on our connection with God. Um, and I just find if you work prayerfully through the day and thank God and see him in everything, then you develop that mind that we're looking for. Okay, we find biblical truths about the mind of Christ um, from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and this is just giving a bit of a summary, that uh, the mind of Christ stands in sharp contrast to the wisdom of man, and that's in 1 Corinthians 2, 5 to 6, and it does. It talks about we've got God's wisdom or we've got the worldly wisdom, and we want the wisdom of, of God, and that's having the mind of Christ, we're given that wisdom. We think of Solomon, he was the, one of the wisest men on earth. He asked for wisdom. So if we ask for wisdom, we can have it. The mind of Christ involves wisdom from God. So that's where we get it from. Um, it was once hidden, but now it's revealed. And he said when he left, he will send us the comforter. And he had to go so we could all have uh, the comforter, every one of us, which when we work with the spirit, we have that wisdom that comes from God. And it's through the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is given to believers through the spirit of God. Okay. So this is where the conscience works and the Holy Spirit can work through the conscience um, with God's spirit or the spirit of Christ, we call it, to sanctify us. So it's through the spirit that helps the mind to be Christ-like. It's our connection. So if we don't listen to the spirit or we shut the spirit out and we, we ignore the prompting of the spirit, that's where we lose that capacity to have the mind of Christ. So, But he was totally connected. He walked in God's spirit. The mind of Christ cannot be understood by those without the spirit. So this is where when you talk to people, invite the Holy Spirit in, not just for you, but for that person, because they can then understand it's through that spirit. And that's what Jesus did. He walked in that spirit. Um, and the mind of Christ gives believers discernment in spiritual matters. 
And I know that is so important because it's so easy in deception to not see the spiritual matters. We get caught up in the world. So we can ask for that spiritual discernment, which I believe is a good thing to ask for. So it comes back to how can we have the mind of Christ? Um, in order to have the mind of Christ, we must first have faith in him. So that's in John 1.12 and 1 John 5.12. So how is your faith going? We need to strengthen our faith. And what is faith? It's not a feeling. It's what we believe. And I believe with all my heart and my mind that we can have the mind of Christ, that he can transform us. And as we looked at some of the earlier aspects of the brain, it's not just the inner person that's transformed, the whole brain, the body, the cells, everything is transformed. Um, and this is why it is so powerful. So we need that saving faith. We need to strengthen our faith every day. And it's you can feel terrible. You can feel lost. You can feel confused. But if you or you can feel down in the dumps or in a bit of darkness, a bit depressed. But if you have faith and your faith says, I don't care how I feel. God is with me. And we talk to him. We cry out to him in faith we will get an answer and it will be in God's time, not necessarily our time, but we will get an answer. Now, the word produces faith and this is why we need to read daily, read the Bible and whenever you open your Bible, ask for the Holy Spirit to guide you and follow that guidance. I find writing things down and you might read a passage and it leads you to something else. The Spirit will lead you and I often get um, what I need on a daily basis because I do that. I, I, I think, oh, I need to study this today and then I open my book or open a Bible and it takes me in another direction that's led by the Spirit. Um, I mean, most people nowadays, probably all people have phones of some sort, but mobile phones, you can download Bible apps and they send you a memory verse or a verse, uh, a daily verse. And I find that often is exactly what I need to hear. So I've got a couple of those at different times in the morning. Um, I get these verses appear and it's amazing how accurate. See, God knows what we need. And then I might go back to my Bible and use it. So do everything you can to focus on the word, to put the word or the meaning of the verses into memory. Now, the Holy Spirit indwells and enlightens us, infuses us with wisdom that is the mind of Christ. When we are walking with God, when we are walking with his spirit, even if we're feeling bad and we our faith is actioning and we don't listen to those feelings because that's what the devil wants us to do, but our healthy mind or your mind can go, no, I don't want to go the way I feel. I want to go the way I know. I want to go the way the spirit tells me or my faith tells me. So as we yield to the spirit's leading, this is in Ephesians 4.30. We allow the spirit to transform and renew our mind, which we looked at in Romans 12.1 and 2. This is sanctification, right? This is how we are sanctified by allowing the spirit through the mind, and this is where the conscience and the will is actioned, and it renews the mind. And it's not just renewing it with information. It renews all the cells in the mind. And this is where we must never underestimate the physiology of the brain and how the mind is expressed because if, you, if your brain is badly programmed and the cells are not doing well and they're not healthy, then how can we renew it? You know, how can we renew it spiritually? So this is where when we, uh, and we'll be looking at again tomorrow night, we're going to add this in a bit more of how can I have a healthy mind um, and a healthy brain to allow God to transform us. We have a health message that works. So this is important. Um, now, we can do any work for the Lord and the mind that Jesus had. The mind of man is to blend with the mind of Christ. So it's a blending. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's like a partnership. It's a yoking. And we know that Christ said he's a burden bearer and he, he will take our yoke. This union sanctifies the understanding, giving the thoughts, clearness and force and this is from um an article having the mind of christ 
Now, let, it, let us keep ourselves in a cheerful frame of mind. It is our privilege through faith to have the mind of Christ and to abide in him. Now, how about we have a cheerful mind? And that's hard. You've just had uh, awful things happening, uh, wearing you down during the day. How can you have a cheerful frame of mind? Well, learn to laugh at yourself a bit more. Sense of humour is good. And I find, well, don't buy into it. Don't think about it. Don't allow the mind to dwell on it and go, no, Jesus knows what I need. It's okay. Say a prayer, talk to God, put on some praise music, do something that keeps the mind cheerful and doesn't dwell and feed. It's a feeding or starving. And it's through faith, as we said, we can have the mind of Christ and abide in him. Isn't that a wonderful thing? It's from the similar reference, having the mind of Christ. Now, I've just done a summary there. Those who are one with Christ have the mind of Christ and work the works of Christ. They are ever improving, ever drawing near to God, ever uplifting the soul to Jesus. So daily we uplift ourselves to Jesus. By beholding the world's redeemer, they become changed into his image. Now, have you met people and go, oh, they're so Christ-like because they're selfless. They're there, they're helping. And if you've met someone who helps and doesn't think of themselves, it's an amazing experience. And when you do that for others, they're often quite shocked. And I often get if I do something because I see a need and I don't think of I might be tired, but I don't think of that. I go, no, they need help. People say people never do that for me. So this is saying how bad the world is. So be compassionate, be caring. And by beholding Jesus, we are changed and we can up lift our soul to him and be changed into his image. It is so important. So a new spiritual life is created, a new mo uh, motive um, power supplied when one is fully emptied of self. So this means we have to forget about our, ourselves, stop feeling sorry for ourselves and pampering ourselves, um, and we've got to cast out. This is that um, double-mindedness. We've got to cast out anything that we put before God, which is a false god, is cast out of the soul. So anything we put before God, we have to um, remove or give up. Give it to God. Pray about it. He will replace it with something far better. And the vacuum is supplied by the inflowing of the Spirit of Christ. So this is where we want that inflowing. We want Christ and we want that Spirit. And we can have it. And there, are, I mean, I'm just touching on points and things, but there is so much you can explore and find out for yourself, particularly in the Bible. And I find the Spirit of Prophecy and other wonderful writers so let's uh, round up with this when your mind is renewed you will have the mind of christ and walk with him in his spirit daily and it's the greatest experience no matter what happens to you or what's going in in the world we have such an awful world don't look ahead look to this day and walk in his spirit so in romans 12 1 to 2 and it talks about living sacrifices to God and says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Remember, your body includes the brain and the heart and the whole system. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That is when we have the mind of Christ. And it is, I've got there, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And it certainly is. So 1 Corinthians 2.16 will finish with, for who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So there's a lot of food for thought there. There's a lot of things that you can do um, that will help you have that mind. And so if you watch again tomorrow night, I'll be talking about more about this as far as the will and the conscience goes and how can we strengthen our will, which will help us to have the mind of Christ on a daily basis. Amen. Wonderful. Um, yeah, really good presentation um, slash sermon. Um, really good advice and um, you know the Bible obviously has all the information we need to have to have the 
mind of Christ. It does. So, yeah, what I find amazing is that our brain is so limited after the fall, yet mm-hmm. so little is known about the brain that we still don't know, um, you know, enough about the brain. I guess we don't know everything about the brain. No, we don't. In fact, we know minimal. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. Um, yeah, we want to encourage everyone to ask questions. Um, you can type them on youtube in the chat section and we'll address them in the next half hour pretty much um so we do have some questions jennifer to ask you if we can address them so what came to mind as well you were talking about how jesus got his wisdom from um, the father and these verses came to mind as well in john 5 30 how he says um as i hear i judge and my judgment is righteous because i do not seek my own will but the oh, will of the father who sent me yeah and john 8 um, 28 where he says um I do nothing of myself, but as the Father taught me, I speak these things. So then we have to, our source of um, wisdom has to be Jesus as well, right? It does. It does. Because it's through Christ, he's our um, our intermediary, I guess. He came to connect us with God. He is God. So we, mm-hmm. we connect with Christ. It's hard to connect with God because we don't see God. But Christ is God and came to us physically and had all the attributes of God and always stayed connected to him. Therefore, in knowing Christ, we know God. And he said, if you know me, you know the Father. So if we get to know Christ, it gives us a tangible way of understanding the character and nature of God, how much he loves us, what an amazing brain, which he knows every part. He knows every hair on our head. Therefore, he knows every part of our mind and our brain which is a wonderful thing. (laughs) Yes, definitely. So, um, Jennifer, you talked about um, brain cells and creating new pathways and all of that. So when we we talk about losing brain cells, you said um, use it or lose it. And Mm -hmm. we know that um, to be very true. So what about um, recovering, replacing or creating new brain cells? Uh, Some things we are told that um, uh, kill the brain cells. So can we recover or can we replace them? We can. It's an amazing thing, the brain. Um, our whole system, and I did say this, where science has found the brain when it's it's broken, it wants to heal itself. It's designed, God's mm-hmm. given us a whole self-healing mechanism. So when the brain is damaged, it will do a lot of self-healing. And as I said before, they find that with people with strokes. If it can't put it in that part of the brain or that part of the body anymore, it creates a new pathway. Um, another, they find people um, with who drink alcohol, for example, and you're killing lots of brain cells with alcohol, and there's a point where the brain becomes damaged. And it can, when you do that level of tissue damage, it can never fully be repaired, not with something like alcohol. But they do find that when the person stops drinking, there is a level of recovery because some of the brain cells will be renewed. Even though they've been damaged, they can be renewed. So, and it is that use it or lose it. So even science is encouraging us to use our brain to extend our capacity to think and reason and work with our emotions to be able to strengthen the mind and the brain because it keeps producing these new brain cells. Um, We've got two parts of the brain that are what they call neuroplastic and that is in the base of the emotional brain or the limbic system called the hypothalamus and the amygdala. The amygdala stores emotional memories and the hypothalamus stores lots of memories of events and things that we recall. Now, those are the two parts of the brain that actually make new cells and they find there are lots of great things we can do. Exercise rapidly increases the brain cells in those two areas. Um, You can grow the brain. And they found people with um, Alzheimer's, there was 
every so often there was someone who died of Alzheimer's, but they didn't lose their memory because we always associate Alzheimer's with memory loss. And when they did an autopsy, they found that that part of the brain, the hypothalamus and that had was incredibly large because they had spent their life storing so many memories. So when they got uh, Alzheimer's, it didn't totally destroy the brain because it was such an enlarged area. So we want to grow those parts of the brain. So our attitude, our beliefs, you know, working, using the brain. This is why studying the word and putting things to memory and gaining that wisdom and insight, it grows that part of the brain um, where we can access it and use it. Uh, we make these new cells to be used during the day. And there's lots of good research. One, mm -hmm. uh, one I've heard about is uh, within a work environment where they um, got people to exercise for half an hour before they started work. They found they had less absenteeism, they had a better brain focus, and they got they achieved more during the day. They could focus the brain in the present a lot more because of that half hour of exercise. So there we go. Get out yeah. there, exercise. It's amazing. Yeah. We keep hearing about it, yet it's so... Um, difficult i guess to get motivated it seems to be a cycle you don't exercise you don't mm. feel motivated and then if you don't feel motivated then you can't exercise so i guess you just have to get up and do it well this is where the brain is now looking at a negative focus we're struggling whereas if you instead of looking oh i've got to go and do a half hour so okay and i want to do five minutes today and you might get out in the garden run on the spot walk around just anything to stretch stretching exercises and make it a daily routine where you do something physical and then extend it so there's ways that you can do it or set three times a week to start with or twice a week and then add in more so uh, and this is what I help people do because motivation comes from action. So you don't have to feel like to do it, as you said. You know, you can say, no, I'm going to do this. And when you do it, remember all those brain cells you're growing. Think, wow, mm -hmm. I don't really mind if I keep doing this. <laughs> we get better as we get older. And it's amazing that when you decide to do, okay, today I'll do only five minutes, you start exercising, then you do feel like you can do more and you feel more, yeah. I guarantee you'll feel the benefits if you do that five minutes. You'll feel mm. better, the blood flow, the heart going. You'll just find you feel fresher. It's, uh, it's worth it. Yeah, absolutely. And um, when we talk about um, damaging or killing brain cells, um, can you talk a little bit about um, toddlers, for example, mm -hmm. and how many times they, they hit their head and whatever? What can physical trauma do? Because I, I myself feel like I'm a little bit worried about that. So can that damage yeah. the uh, brain and, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, we can damage the brain. Um, but as I said, the brain can be self-healing. So there's a lot that can be done. But when, it, whether you're a toddler or an adult, a toddler has a softer skull, for example. Um, but when we have a brain trauma injury, whether it be in a car and we're jolted forward or someone hits us in the head or we fall and knock the head, the brain is in fluid. So what happens when we have that sudden hit, the brain hits the frontal lobe, it smashes into it and back again. And that's where, because it's that third of the brain, this one third of the brain, once that's damaged, if it's that badly damaged, that's when they say you're in vegetable state, you're off life support, because that is our total awareness. It's that third of the brain that controls and functions everything, so we must look after it. Hence, wearing helmets if you're on a bike, doing things to protect the mind is important. Mm. Uh, but I believe there can be X amount of repair work done, and that's challenging yourself to do things um, which they find, like we said, with people with strokes, you know, challenging yeah. to do things, to use the mind and uh, do what you used to do. Um, and they have found that when they do rehab with people with brain damage, they can actually rewire the brain and use other aspects. Um, mm -hmm. Examples of, of, of people who've only got one side of the brain, they've had an accident or a tumour or something, um, and they find that when that happens, the 
other side of the brain. So if they've lost the left side of the brain, then the right side actually rewires itself to do both left and right, right function. So isn't that amazing? Yeah. <laughs> Very good news, isn't it? Yeah. So we underestimate the capacity of the brain. So, and mm. I'm not saying it's okay if you go and damage it, but we need to protect the mind and the brain that God has given us. But if it is damaged, a lot of repair work because that's what, God, he, well, Christ is a healer, but God has given us a brain and helps the brain to heal and has given us different remedies in the herbs of the field or foods and things that can help. So mm -hmm. it's a lot. Healthy brain is good. <laughs> yeah. And that's, yeah, that's wonderful. We had a few, um, actually a couple of presentations with Dr. Clark as well where yeah, he was talking about how the brain can recover even after a yeah. stroke and he was talking about um, a father of a neurosurgeon I believe that had a stroke and they had to teach him actually he had to relearn everything like how to hold the spoon and how to walk from you know crawling and everything so it's amazing how it um, it is possible I've heard about that, I've read about that, and that person actually, when when he finally died, he ended up having a long life, and they told the son he'd be a vegetable, take him home, put him in bed, and the son worked with him to rehabilitate over, I think, 12 months. He got back to normal activity. When he died and they did an autopsy, they found that the brain had actually rewired the whole nervous system over the area that had been um that died from the stroke like that it was being scarred and damaged so mm -hmm. incredible the brain actually helped to rewire a whole new nervous system as it was challenged to function mm -hmm. so yeah mm, amazing it is amazing we have an amazing brain and mind yeah so um Jennifer, you were talking about the brain and soul. So can we um, talk about the differences between the mind, brain and soul? How are they connected and how are they different? Well, they're all obviously interrelated. This, as we said, the brain and the mind are separate, but they work together. If we don't have a functioning brain, the mind can't function. And what we, the mind does the brain then will program. So it's like a team, a well-oiled machine when we use them well. Well, what we program in and who we become and who we are is the soul. You know, we um, in, in the Bible it talks about we are a living soul and when Adam was created from clay, then uh, God uh, breathed the spirit into him and he became a living soul. So it's no different for us. Like there are thoughts and no, we are we have a soul. No, we are a living soul. So that means that's the sum total of that person, which is expressed wide into the brain, expressed through the mind. So again, they're all interrelated. You know, our personality and our habits and what we are and who we become. Um, and this is where having the mind of Christ and thinking as He did and having that heart and compassion, allowing Him to work through us, then. We, we will be totally integrated, um, mind, body, soul and spirit. We'll be a whole on a positive. We won't be self-destructing. We'll be rejuvenated, basically, in a total package. Yeah, awesome. Hmm. So um, the next question is, what is the effect of, on children when they depend much time on computer games from an early age through to adulthood? Sadly, this is a major problem. I think they mm. estimate something like oh, up to eight hours a day or whatever. Children are on technology probably more now because, you know, I watch children in my community here and, uh, like they're going off to school and they have got, um, yeah, they're walking along with their phone and everyone's got phones, they're always using technology. So one, and particularly from early childhood, it isolates that child. They do not develop social skills because to develop mm -hmm. social skills, we have to interact and play with other people and other children. Like childhood is meant to be playing, which is what I did. I love playing. 
with others on your own, being creative, interacting, learning social skills. Well, how do you do that when you're playing games on a computer or using social media? It doesn't, we don't develop in a healthy way where we sort of become automatons. It dulls the senses, it dulls the mind. Um, we can't connect with the real world when we grow up doing that. And this is where you're getting children are becoming suicidal, they they can't learn well, um, they become illiterate. You know, the sort of language that's used on texting and that is uh, minimal. So if you have a look, what do they learn? Um, yet at the same time, technology can be used wisely by children to learn, you know, but not overused and use it to inspire or to create versus sitting there and being hypnotised robots, basically, by technology. That's what's happening. It has an effect also on the physiology of the brain. The um, technology, whether it be TV, um, videos or whatever, actually um, puts the brain in a, an hypnotic state. Apparently, the first time you ever watch TV, it takes about 45 minutes to go into that zone. Uh, after that, 45 seconds, you're in the zone. So it mesmerizes, which is very dangerous, we know. So this is what's happening to children. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I guess that's why the channels are called channels, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 <On> channels. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so I guess to continue with that question, the same person is asking, how can the brain heal from the effects of games addiction throughout the stages of child development? Okay. It's going like you'd have to help the child get over the addiction. And look, that is very real. I know I had neighbours at one stage, four children, they decide to leave the phones at home, take the kids away, and they were at different ages from I think about nine into teenage years. And a few days later, the mother arrived back and I said, oh, I thought you were on holiday. She said, oh, I came to get their phones. They're so bored. They didn't want to play board games. They didn't want to walk on the beach. They, they just want their technology. So she went and got their addictive fix and took it to them. So those children are very narrow in what they are doing. Um, first of all, they have to realise, and this is where educating and helping them to see and understand the effects it's having on them, the technology because they're very technology oriented. There's a lot of good information um, to show what happens to the brain when they're using this all the time. Wanting to give it up, showing them better options, uh, and certainly from a Christian perspective, prayer, the power of prayer, bringing them through to Christ, bringing them back to God, because sometimes those children have known God and have then gone into the technology or the addictions. Um, but one, any addiction, you have to come out of denial. First of all, I have to know they've got a problem. So helping them to realise it's a problem. Um, and it, certainly if it's children, they need an adult, a mentor, someone who's going to help them, but not to berate them, but to encourage them and to teach them and to give them better ways. You cannot just take something from the mind and put nothing back in its place. You have to give them a much better belief system and values and help them to maybe start reading good books or doing things that are more constructive and uh, also interacting, social skills, doing things like that, getting them involved in social interaction or creative pursuits, getting the mind because it kills the imagination and their creativity, all this technology. So there's a lot you can do, but it's a hard road and parents really struggle, I think, to help children with this yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, you were also talking about uh, how the brain stores uh, information in the five senses, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the information forms pathways in the brain that can be reinforced to develop permanent mind habits. So mm -hmm. does this mean that um, if we have trauma that is attached to one of those senses mm -hmm. and... Um, we will experience the same trauma again and again every time that sense is um, stimulated? Um, if it's on the subconscious level, yes. And this is where most of those trauma memories are. And 
the irony is if you get the person to remember the trauma, it actually increases and activates it when they consciously remember it if they haven't resolved it. So mm -hmm. one of the things I do with people is to not, I don't want to hear about the trauma because I know it's going to re-traumatise. So looking at how that trauma works very much in the present moment. So identifying and working with the senses, so I getting them to, in an event, to go, well, what senses were happening? What did you hear? What did you see? What did you taste? And being aware of the body and the senses. And often you'll find there might be a sense that they shut down on. One I found is a sense of smell, a client who just stopped smelling because the smells from childhood were so awful and such a trigger, her brain unconsciously shut down the capacity to smell things you know i just don't smell things i've got no no smell and so we worked on what is it she likes in a flower for example and getting her to do things to with smells to activate it one of the things she loved was lavender so i thought right let's work with that get some lavender oil and put it on her and and she did and she started to smell and realized some smells are safe um and then we could actually look and then once you do that and the person feels safe and they're in the present and they've got tools and i get them to breathe and calm and release some of that that um trauma they dial up then they start to connect the memories and then they were, oh, that's why I react to that because I remember that I used to hear that. I'd hear footsteps or I'd hear something. And that's why the, when that happens to me, um, I react that way. So then they can consciously do something about it and turn the senses back on. It's like the brain learns to shut it down because it's too traumatic. That makes sense. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And then it can also be overstimulated, right? Like you can oh. overreact to that as well, the same sense. Yes. yes, you can. And I believe X amount of allergies and things like that are the, the smell triggers a memory that creates that reaction. Mm. Uh, and this is where we are more complex, complex than we realise um, and we need to actually work with that. Um, but you can't. Get the person to consciously connect the dots but if you work with them in the present and get them to start to do some what i call that release work where you reset the nervous system and just by simply um focusing on the heart calming the heart down doing taking some deep slow breaths about five in five out but focus on the heart because when you calm the heart it calms the brain and it switches it back on and allows the nervous system to release that bit of trauma and it's a chipping away because you're not going to release it all at once because mm. the initial trauma has been built on over years. Every time something like it happens or the brain thinks it's like it, whether it's visual or one of the senses or whatever, it adds to the trauma. It's like a uh, funnel and we want to stop expanding the funnel and start to shrink it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's resetting the brain and the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system. And the heart is a key factor, which is interesting because we know the heart is powerful. You know, and how many people have a broken heart these days from different things? And so that healing is powerful and doing it all prayerfully, asking for God's help and direction and allowing the spirit to help you, I find that fast tracks the healing, definitely. Mm hmm Awesome. And you also mentioned something interesting, Jennifer, that you mentioned um, in our last presentations as well, yeah. how reliving the trauma and yeah. actually talking about it doesn't necessarily help. It can actually have the um, the opposite effect. Yeah. Which mm. is, yeah, this is why some of the programs they run or therapies for trauma can actually make it worse not better it might give an instant relief at the time but it makes it worse in the long run and I've had people come to me oh, I did this program and I just feel more traumatized now but I find <laughs> educating the brain teaching the brain what it's what's happening they find is scientifically if you you train the brain and you teach it how it works it works smarter so a lot of what I do is education to help the person understand the brain and the mind and how it's programmed and why it's reacting the way it is. And it's like you get those light bulbs that come on. And so it's, oh, now I get it. 
and you can see that the light bulb comes on and it uplifts them, then we have to work on maintaining the light bulb and growing it, not just turning it off again. So then I get them to do activities and things or read and, you know, write, write things down is really helpful. Um, keep a journal. So there's lots of things you can do to stimulate the brain and help to rewire it and to reset because when your whole nervous system and brain and mind is locked into the past, you're not in the present, which is that past, present and future model. We need to be in the present with Christ. And when you do, he will help the healing process or give you the tools or show you the way or put people in your way to help you. That's how I find yes. it. Works. Mm. Definitely. Very good. So um, another question we have is, um, is the skyrocketing number of children with autism related to change of lifestyle in recent years? Mm. I think there's multiples with autism, some of which we can't really discuss on this platform, but um, whatever you do to the brain and the body can trigger things like autism. Uh, there can be genetic vulnerabilities and weaknesses. Um, I have met um, parents who a child is labelled as on the autism spectrum, but they have had... Um, a violent father and uh, hit the, the head or whatever. And so that, I believe, can be a trigger for autism. Um, certainly lifestyle, but I don't, it's hard to tell. I know if we deprive new children of nutrients, it doesn't relate to autism. It relates to lack of intelligence development. The brain won't develop if they're nutrient deprived, their IQ won't develop. So there are different aspects of it. I, I haven't researched it enough to know how much is that genetic factor. Um, I'd have to look at that in more depth. It's not an area I specialise in, but there's certainly it's increased markedly, and I believe that is to do with lifestyle and what we're putting into our bodies as well. Yeah, because it's a neurological condition, isn't it? It's not anything to do with intelligence. It's, yeah. you know, I guess whatever affects the mind on that level. Yes. It is. And it seems to be a sensitivity disorder where there's like a heightened sensitivity um, where that child is overstimulated, easily overstimulated, which is a brain function. So but because I haven't worked with it, I don't know how much um, you need to do to work on that or whether you can work on it. It's not an area, as I said, I've worked with. Mm. Mm hmm very good. So, and another question, what are some ways that church members and church communities work to facilitate mental health? Right. Well, I think um, church members need to understand what we're talking about and work on the brain and maximising what God has given us and working um, as the disciples did, come together in one mind and one accord because we can't go and teach and do things and help people unless we're doing it ourselves. So I think that's the biggest factor. We have to walk daily with Christ and have that mind, have that compassion and that love. So it has to come from the heart because then people are receptive. You know, people know the difference when you're with God, that love that's there, they know there's something different. They say, there's something different about you. How come you're always happy? Or why do you do so much for so many? And then you can talk about it and help them and connect. We want to connect. First of all, we have to connect. You can't teach anyone you're not connected to. So that's important. Um, true. Yeah, very true. Um, so um, just another question, Jennifer, about, again, um, the physical head trauma, for example. Um, can that affect someone's future character development or, I guess, the moral decisions that they make? Because we know the, the famous case of Phineas Gage. Yeah, I was um, say. <laughs> yeah. There's more since then, I'm sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It will certainly any damage to the brain can change the personality. They find with like people with dementia, um, as the brain deteriorates and the short term memory loss occurs, they can be more aggressive. 
so, not all of them, but some become much more aggressive. So mm -hmm. definitely change the character of that person in how they express themselves. But this is where God is wonderful and forgiving. He understands. He knows what that person's gone through and we don't understand it all, but he must be making allowances for in some way or helping those people um, and we need to have compassion and help them. But certainly brain damage and certainly aggression seems to be more prominent in people who have brain trauma and damage. Um, that seems to be a major factor for some people with their personality. Because mm -hmm. that, I guess, can make us understand as well that um, that's one of the reasons we should not be judging, right? We don't know what the person has been through um as 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 a child what they yeah, went through that um you know makes them act in a certain way so there's always everyone has a story there's a story behind why we are like we are <clears throat> and unless we take that into account we do judge criticize or shut down or reject that person um and i find like with people so well, how do you deal with anger you know i don't cope well with angry people but i find if someone was angry and uh, you know they might and i found this working with clients that there's all this anger coming out and then they say i'm not angry with you i'm just angry because but often we take it personally we think they're angry with us but i find if you listen and acknowledge and say i can see you're really angry about that because people don't they get away from them, they ignore them, they react back to them, but they don't empathise with them or go, oh, I'm really sorry that that's upset you so much. It helps to calm the person down and talk about it and resolve it. So there's a lot we can do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Very good. Um, so we can address this question as well it says can children be misdiagnosed with adhd when there is actually trauma and anxiety at home oh definitely i find there's a lot of misdiagnosis at times with people who have trauma um, because they often a traumatized child or adult will have what we call mood swings they might be hyper, they might be wound up and they've got so much adrenaline and then they'll go in a slump and they can go into depression and that. But it's not necessarily a biological or inherited disorder. It is what's happening because of that trauma that's driving that child. So, And anxiety often presents as anger, which is an interesting one. And I've had that where I go, you're so angry. No, I'm just really anxious and it mm -hmm. presents... So it's, um, it's hard to do diagnosis of people until you really get to know them and have a look at what's driving the problem, including things like ADHD. But that can also be, I find sugar is a huge factor in ADHD. And this is why I work with nutrition as well. And I had a case of a woman whose child was, oh, couldn't keep the room tidy, wouldn't <clears throat> do jobs around the house, couldn't maintain doing homework. <clears throat> and uh, came to me with that child for counselling and I said, well, let's have a look at what the child's eating, what about at night and could come home and she'd give it probably cordial and all sorts of things. So we wiped out all sugar and looked at some healthy snacks when the child came home that sustained blood sugars. She rang me a week later and said, oh, we don't need to come again. He's, he's really good. So <laughs> it, he presented with an ADHD, but it was really sugar-loaded and probably a bit of adrenaline amongst it that uh, mm -hmm. caused it. Yeah, yeah, very good, very true. So um, we were also talking about um, reading, um, you mentioned as well how meditation and um, knowing the right God can help with the brain function and mm -hmm. memory as well. So um, can you give us advice about this um Jennifer, because we know that we can, it's easier to just listen to sermons or presentations and do whatever we need to do. How does it compare with reading an actual physical book? Um, I think reading is important because it actually stimulates our imagination and our thinking and our reasoning um, because we have a lot of visuals, whereas technology takes away that creativity or that imagination that god has given us 
Um, I mean, you have a look at our heavenly home. If we didn't have an imagination and read the word and looked at it, then we wouldn't have, you know, when you do that, wow, it really stimulates you because you're reading it and visualising it, whereas technology takes that away. Um, but also to gain information, and it comes back when you're watching a sermon, for example, or listening, the compassion or passion of that person and how Christ-like they are and spirit-filled they are, even in just listening to them on the media, can be highly positive and stimulating. So there are a number dynamics but we need a I think a mixture of both sometimes good to do visuals and listen and think that way and other times it's better to read and you know just yeah. work that way thank you that's that's very good and um I, I just want to touch on this question as well really quickly and then we will um finish off with that so okay. you said that depression is unresolved past baggage a lot of the time so what about uh, what comes to mind is postnatal depression is mm -hmm. that um depression based on what we are currently going through or that's just a trigger perhaps well it's an interesting one um post um natal depression because they have found when you look at the history of a lot of those women who suffer badly have had actually trauma in their childhood um, and then I believe the hormonal imbalances can cause that depression. Yet I know women who've had got pregnant and had children and actually the hormonal shift has been positive for them, not negative, but in this case it's negative. So you'd have to look at the history of that person, which so when they get diagnosed with it and go for help, they need to look at all of that and take into account um, are there other factors driving and it just happens having that child because it's more than just hormonal i mean when you have a child a baby well, it's a huge challenge it triggers the whole thing of a mother and your own mother you know what's happened there between you and your mum because you're now a mum but also you now have to shift your focus from just being yourself to another person another uh, little being that you're caring for so when you have a look it's multifaceted that can contribute to that Mm -hmm. so. true um we have one last question if that's okay to address that one as well um so the question is how can church members help in a society suffering from trauma due to various negative factors i think it comes back to that similar to what i said before we have to walk with jesus we have to have the mind the heart of jesus because that makes a difference people with the way the world has been, we've been shut down and isolated for many reasons. Um, life has become stressful and it's like people feel isolated and that nobody cares. So as church members, if we show we care, this is an ideal opportunity to minister, to do what Christ did, to get out there and help people, whether you meet them in a supermarket and they're struggling or, you know, I've heard of, of people who... Uh, and, and certainly some of them are church members who've seen that, you know, in, in line in the supermarket and someone doesn't have enough money to pay and they give them money to pay. And that person is, you know, what a wonderful witness that someone cares enough. You know, why are you doing that for me? And it's an opening. Yeah, you know, so I've heard of some wonderful stories of that sort of thing. So we don't know and we won't know everything until we meet Jesus as to how much what we do affects and helps people. So to live that life, to have the heart and mind of Christ and to stop looking at ourselves and as, as a group, as an individual and actually get out there and do everything we can to help those poor people who are struggling. Amen. Thank you so much for all the information, Jennifer. Thank you for sharing um, your insights. And um, if we can, yeah, if we can ask you to close with a word of prayer happy to dear heavenly father we thank you so much for your blessings and your mercy and especially that you have given us a mind and a brain that can be healed that can grow in your grace and we pray for each one of us and anyone listening that you will heal their mind and heal each one of us so 
we can be like you and that we can have your heart and your mind and we know then doesn't matter what happens in our life we can be a blessing to others and we can be uplifted and share that love and um and the wonderful grace you give us with those around us please be with each one of us now and bless us in jesus name amen amen Thank you very much, um, Jennifer, for sharing. And we want to thank everyone as well for the questions and for joining us tonight. Please join us again tomorrow evening, 7 p.m. Um, Australian Eastern Standard Time to discuss more. And our topic will be on the... Um, the, what was the topic, <laughs> Jennifer? The, the true force of the will. <laughs> true force of the will. I wanted to make sure I, I, I got that exactly right. So, yeah, looking forward to seeing everyone. God bless and um, have a blessed Sabbath.